It is my honor to introduce to you today's speaker, Stephen M. Dettelbach, the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Ohio. A summary of his many accomplishments and distinguished career are set forth in the brochure on your table. Mr. Dettelbach was nominated by President Obama on July 10, 2009, and unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate on September 15, 2009, as United States Attorney for the Northern District of Ohio. Mr. Dettelbach and his over 60 assistant United States attorneys serves the northern 40 counties of Ohio from offices in Cleveland, Toledo, Akron, and Youngstown. His office enforces federal criminal law, which includes a wide range of crimes dealing with national security, public corruption, civil rights, drug trafficking, and many types of so-called white-collar crime. Under Mr. Dettelbach's leadership, his office has aggressively focused on growing problems in our communities, such as gang violence, human trafficking, illegal possession of guns, child pornography, and of course today's topic, the heroin epidemic. On the civil side, Mr. Dettelbach's office defends the United States when it is a party of litigation and brings cases seeking enforcement of laws in such areas as civil rights, housing discrimination, and environmental law. Consistent with his long commitment to equal justice, he's created a dedicated civil rights division within his office. These are just some of our speaker's efforts to make life better for the citizens of the Northern District of Ohio. It's my honor to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Stephen M. Dettelbach, United States Attorney for the Northern District of Ohio. Uh, I want to thank you, Judge Adams, for that very, very kind introduction uh, and for inviting me here today. Uh, uh, off script, I just want to say, you know, we have an incredible federal uh, court community. And we have uh, uh, Judge Adams, uh, Judge Leoy, uh, Judge Cook, Judge Burke, uh, who are here today. Uh, I just want to say, you know, oftentimes we sit in that building and uh, I think by design our, our founders separated us a little bit from the community. I think that was wise. Uh, but you need to understand that uh, our federal court system is really the crown jewel of our community and our democracy, and we owe that to the people who work in it uh, every day. So I want to thank them very, very much for their dedication. <laughs> well, uh, sadly, uh, if uh, you have seen the Beacon Journal today, uh, the topic of my speech, although I'll plan months in advance, is time limit. Uh, but I want you to understand that there is a long story and narrative behind those headlines. And that story begins and happens every day in the United States and right here in Akron. You go in for a minor operation at the hospital, a medical procedure, maybe to get a tooth pulled, and everything goes pretty well. When you're about to leave, the doctor pulls out his or her prescription pad to give you a little something for the pain. Maybe you're in a lot of pain. Maybe you're in a little discomfort. Maybe you feel pretty close to fine. But the doctor gives you the script just in case. Maybe it's for 20 pills of Percocet. Maybe it's 40. Maybe it's even 60. And when you get home, you take two pills the first day. You don't want to, but you take two because you're hurting. And then the next day, you're feeling better, but you're still in some pain, so you take two more. And the next day, things are feeling a little bit better, so you just take one of those pills. And then it's time to get back to work and live your life, and you go pretty much back to normal. But you still have 55 Percocets sitting around your home, and they migrate into your medicine cabinet. And there they sit for a week, for a month, for a year, without you giving it very much thought at all, until even though you're not thinking about them. They act like little ticking time bombs. Because next Thanksgiving, or Christmas, or New Year's Day, or family reunion, your nephew, your son, your daughter, your niece, your neighbor are visiting your home, and they go into that bathroom, and they look into that cabinet, and they grab pills out of that bottle and put them in their pocket. 
and that niece, that nephew, that son, that daughter, that neighbor are off to the races on their way to a horrible opioid addiction. An addiction that more and more frequently morphs from pills into heroin, another opioid, and with startling frequency, an addiction whose battle ends on a slab in the coroner's office. Another life taken, another family destroyed. I'm here today to talk about the heroin opioid problem we all face here in Northern Ohio and to provide to you some stark and startling facts about what we're seeing in the law enforcement community, what we have been seeing for some time, and to let you know about some of the important efforts that are going on around the state and right here in Akron that provide us with some hope that we can push back on this epidemic. Now some of the things I'm going to talk to you about, some of these efforts involve law enforcement. But many involve a broad cross-section of the community. They involve doctors and hospitals and treatment professionals and police officers and parents and PTAs. And that is the message I want to begin and end with. That we cannot do this alone. We need your help. Which is why I am happy that we have such a good group today and why I am indebted to the Akron Roundtable and to Jacqueline and to Judge Adams for helping to bring the community's attention, your attention, to heroin and our community's response. Now when I joined the Justice Department, which was back in the early 90s, the vast majority of federal drug trafficking cases dealt with cocaine and either powder or crack cocaine. And I know if you remember, that was the time of Miami Vice and Scarface, with those piles of cocaine. And, and those were the cases that we were doing. We were going after massive international uh, cocaine distribution rates. But I'll tell you, you know, I've been in this job for five years, and in five years we have seen a very significant change in our caseload. The drug trafficking cases in our office have shifted almost exclusively, not quite, from cocaine to heroin. What happened? Well, it's not that complicated. The drug, ship, the drug traffickers saw a shift in demand. And although they're criminals, they're very savvy business people. And they have adjusted their product to fit that new demand. And why was there a shift in demand? And I would submit to you that a major factor has been the literal explosion of painkillers being prescribed in our state and in our nation. Let me give you some numbers. In 1997, there were, for every man, woman, and child in Ohio, seven pain pills prescribed in that year. So that's, you just take the population, you take the number of pills prescribed, you divide it, you get seven for every man, woman, and child. Now let's fast forward to 2010, just a little more than a decade later. In that year, for every man, woman, and child in Ohio, there were, wait for it, 67 pills prescribed. That is an increase of 900%. And I'm pretty sure that the level of pain in Ohio did not increase 900% during those years. Ohio and our nation had been flooded with pain pills. Now some of these pills were coming from what we call pill mills. Those are just general <laughs> drug distribution entities where the person happens to wear a lab coat and carry a stethoscope. You get, uh, anybody with a pulse gets a pill in exchange for money, of course. Some of the problems, but not all. It is far more common for us to see good doctors, physicians we all know, respect, and like, who have come to prescribe pills for a variety of different reasons. And by the way, many of these are legitimate reasons. The reasons also, however, include new incentives patient satisfaction scores that are now built into every visit to a patient in a hospital and soon in out-of-hospital settings. And, quite frankly, aggressive marketing from large pharmaceutical companies that have made billions of dollars out of those scripts and out of those pills. They all set up a system that sometimes encourages good people, good physicians, to what I call write with a heavy pen on that prescription pen. 
Now, some people get hooked on the pills following the surgery themselves. Others take the painkillers recreationally. They get them on the secondary market. And others don't take them themselves, but divert and sell them to third parties. Any way you look at it, the pills get expensive. And what happens is people either run out of the pills or they run out of money. And what do they do when that happens? What we found is that they turn to heroin, which is in the same pharmacological family. It's also an opioid, which they can get for a fraction of the cost and much easier than they can get Percocet or Vicodin. And sadly, we've seen that here in Akron. Many of you know the story of Chris Jackamy. Chris was a star quarterback at Mentor High School near Cleveland, Ohio. And he came here to the University of Akron on a football scholarship. In fact, the head of the criminal division in my office, Dave Serlage, coached him in peewee football. And, you know, like all the kids who make it to a strong football program in college on a scholarship, he was stronger and faster and better than everybody ever played against. But the one opponent that Chris Jackman couldn't beat was Harold. Chris got hooked on painkillers after a shoulder surgery. And the need to feed that addiction, that constant call, led to him at first stealing from teammates and eventually getting kicked off the Akron football team. He turned to heroin. And after stints in and out of court, and in and out of rehab, he tragically died Thanksgiving weekend in 2011. Now, this is a story of an athlete, right? So we know about it. And I'd like to tell you all here that that story is an outlier, an isolated tragedy, but it just isn't. In Cuyahoga County, just to the north, heroin deaths have increased 400% in the last five years. Last year alone, one year, 200 people died from heroin overdose in Cuyahoga County. And Summit County, as you know, has its own issues. In the last two years, there have been 41 and 45 heroin overdose deaths, respectively. That's 86 people. That's 86 families, 86 fathers, 86 mothers, countless brothers and sisters and friends. Just this week, just today in the paper we saw, five people have died from heroin overdose in this city. These are tragedies. And these tragedies, these fatalities, they cut across all demographics. Black, white, young, old, city, suburb, rural, rich, poor, you name it. This is a tragedy that knows no community, state, or local boundaries. And fatal overdoses are really just one way to measure the crushing impact of the heroin epidemic. A staggering amount of other crime is related to heroin, whether it's people actually dealing the drugs who we prosecute, or stealing copper to get enough money to get their fix, or worse. We saw that a couple weeks ago when in your county, your county prosecutor Sherry Bevan Walsh procured a conviction in a quadruple murder that was related to heroin. So there's secondary effects beyond just people taking this poison. The problem is real, and it is, and frankly has been at crisis levels. But it's just not one kind of problem. And that's what I want to emphasize. We have a law enforcement problem. We have a health care problem, and we have a treatment problem. And we have to focus more on stopping this problem before it starts. And I say that as somebody in law enforcement. Because I will tell you firsthand, and the law enforcement officers here will tell you firsthand, Chief Nice is here, that when it comes to heroin, a gram of prediction is worth 10 kilos of cure because the grip of this drug is so strong once it takes hold that it rarely lets go, even when people go repeatedly back into recovery. You know, I hear about this all the time. Um, I, I talk to people about this, and in the spring, I was at a law enforcement office talking about a big uh, heroin uh, drug arrest. And after I was done talking about it, a secretary who works in this office pulled aside somebody from my office and crying. Uh, and also, you know, really not justifiably, but maybe a little bit timid and, and ashamed. 
she thanked this person for our efforts to curb the problem. This police department secretary, this person who worked in law enforcement, explained how her own daughter, who was also a mother, got hooked on painkillers that led to heroin. She confided this law enforcement employee, and she didn't know how it was going to end for her daughter, even standing there, because it was such a tough problem to deal with, in rehab and out of rehab. She worried every day, every day, as we all would about our kid, right? that one mistake that her daughter might make, just one bad day, might land her in the morgue. That every time the phone rang, it might be that phone call. You know, the pain that we can all relate to that this parent felt was evident. Because we can cite numbers and statistics and try to uh, get shock value all we want, but when a person you know actually deals with this issue, the number one is really all that matters, because one is too many. So we have this multifaceted problem. It's a problem that affects real people. And I submit to you, we need a multifaceted solution to the problem. And I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that people have been working on. Um, in my office and in many of the, the disciplines I mentioned, because this is really, you're going to hear, a team effort. In my office, trying to come up with a comprehensive, multifaceted response. First, we turn to sort of our traditional partners, the DEA, the FBI, uh, the Ohio Attorney General, the many fine police departments we work with to try to come up with a law enforcement plan. Next, we turn to non-traditional partners like the Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals, Metro Health up in Cleveland, the County Medical Examiner, to try to expand our response beyond just law enforcement. And now, we're reaching even further, talking to people who handle and run recovery centers, outreach workers, social workers, people who handle needle exchanges, people in recovery, and people who have had family tragedies. The goal has been to try to invite as many committed people as we can to try to create an overall response that would tie together a lot of these efforts that are already going on out in the community and to fill in any gaps that we identified. Now, we started in Cuyahoga County meeting in our office, but we realized pretty quickly that if we wanted to make any progress on the issue, we needed to get out of the courthouse and into the community. Uh, and one of the things we decided to do was to put together a day-long summit on heroin at the Cleveland Clinic. We, we do these kinds of meetings and convenings often, but in this one, we'll tell you, we put out the word and 700 people showed up that day at the Cleveland Clinic. So work day in the middle of the day to share their concern, to share their progress, to share their ideas. And I will tell you, having done these things, you get 700 people who show up in something you have tapped into a big issue in the community. We talked about law enforcement, we talked about treatment, we talked about education, and we talked about healthcare policy issues. And the result of the summit uh, was two things. It was first, an action plan, a written action plan with deliverable, measurable goals. And this is that plan. You can find our copies that sit over there at the table. Anybody can have them, they're on our website. Um, but it was more than just a written plan, a product. The result of the day was a task force and a commitment to continue our efforts. The group that we put together at that summit stayed together as a task force to work on opioid addiction. And both the task force and the action plan were broken down into four sections or committees. I've already described it overall, but you can guess it. It's education and prevention, law enforcement, that's my day job, treatment, and healthcare policy. And each group set goals, both long-term goals and short-term goals, both things that we could achieve right away and things that were uh, a little more difficult to get to, and then devised plans and assigned responsibility to try and achieve those goals. So I'll give you an example. On the prevention side, we had a, pro a program that had been started by a Cuyahoga County judge uh, who had been going out sort of on his own and giving talks on heroin uh, the dangers of heroin and opioid addiction in uh, community, various community places. And he's gotten great results, right? He had just put the word out that this judge was coming and 100 people would show up. Uh, but, you know, this judge uh, has an important lot of responsibilities in his, in his job as a, as a judge. His whole job can't be to educate the community every night. So what we did is we took his plan and we institutionalized it and tried to get him some help 
So we send out teams to do these things in a more organized way. Uh, another goal of the group was that there weren't enough drop boxes for those pills that sit in your cabinet. So the goal was to engage the law enforcement community, the chiefs, to make sure that there was a drop box in every single community in Cuyahoga County. And I think we're pretty much there right now. The healthcare policy group had goals too. And not, su not surprisingly, the healthcare policy group was dominated by doctors. And one of the things that they identified was House Bill 170, which is the bill that would allow first responders and families to get access to naloxone, which is this incredible antidote that can literally save the lives of people who have overdosed on heroin. Uh, and uh, together, this group decided they were going to push for that to get passed. And there was some opposition to that at first, but through uh, the will of that group and through constant trips that they made to Columbus, talking to legislators, the governor signed that bill into law. You know, to give you an example of how important the anecdote and naloxone can be, Moraine County, just to the north, was one of the pilot sites for letting uh, first responders have uh, naloxone. And last November, in Moraine County, there was this deadly batch of fentanyl-laced heroin that hit the streets. And sort of similar to the kinds of things that you see experienced in different communities, maybe even this community. And two people died, tragically. But there were, there were probably about 20 saves in that week that law enforcement was able to, to effectuate and save the lives of people who would have otherwise died. And compare that with Pittsburgh, just a couple hours away, where 20 people tragically died from heroin overdose because of one of these loads in a, in a one to two week period. And the law enforcement side, we also set goals and made strides. The first one relates to how police respond to a fatal overdose. Now here's the secret, uh, the dirty little secret of uh, overdose response. In the past, all too often, when police would get to a scene and they'd see somebody who had died from an overdose at the scene, they'd get the call, they'd get to the scene, and they'd call it in to the, uh, to the uh, uh, ambulance, uh, to the coroner, and they'd get in their car and they'd roll away. Right? There's no murder. It's a person who's addicted who's dead. It's not, it's not really our, our core job. And that's changing. I think it's important. And the people who are changing it are the people in law enforcement, people like Chief Nice and his group of heroin investigators that are here today. So now in Cuyahoga County, working with the Cleveland Police, the Sheriff, and the Prosecutor, there's a written investigative protocol for how to handle fatal overdose scenes. And it starts the moment that the police arrive. They treat it like a crime scene. That cell phone, the physical evidence at the scene, the witnesses who might be there, all aimed at trying to figure out who gave that lethal heroin to the person who died. Detectives respond, prosecutors respond, and what we're trying to do is to establish enough evidence to bring a case that will allow us to charge the people uh, who supplied the fatal heroin either in the state system uh, with uh, a manslaughter or in appropriate cases in the federal system with the death resulting enhancement that carries a very significant mandatory minimum. Now we brought a few of those cases already, including one here, in which an Akron man sold heroin that resulted in the death on Christmas Day in a motel in Green. And those cases are pending in our system. <coughs> but we could not have done that case and all those cases without the fine work of the first responders who are changing the way that they view heroin overdose scenes. Uh, so I want to say thank you to, to them, including your chief, who has created a dedicated heroin unit that looks to track the source of the drugs and to bring these charges when the facts allow it. I'm proud to say that at least some of the costs of these types of projects are being funded by a grant from the Justice Department because you are on the front lines in this issue and the things you do are being looked at all over the country. I hope you're also seeing billboards and hearing public service announcements in Summit County because people in your community are also conducting a public awareness campaign. This is very important because people don't want to admit they have a heroin problem. You get this response all the time. You go to school, you tell them you want to talk about marijuana, you tell them you want to talk about violent crime, about guns. Yes, absolutely address the student body. You tell them you want to talk about heroin. You know, I don't think so. We don't really have that problem here. Go look somewhere else. 
So having a public awareness campaign, a leading public campaign, talking about this problem being everywhere is very, very important. And one of the really, I think, great things that you're leading the country and the, and the state in uh, is response to uh, non-lethal overdoses. This is a very exciting program that you're doing here, and ADM is, is leading the way, which is that a non-lethal overdose situation, this person doesn't die, an intervention specialist is getting sent to the emergency room to talk to the person who had the overdose. Because all the studies show that that's one of the key moments in the course of an addict's life, is right after the overdose. And having a person there uh, when they, after, after the overdose, to try and get them to get into treatment increases the chances that we can turn that life around. It's a simple idea, but it's both supported by the medical research and, frankly, by common sense. <coughs> So we're going to continue, of course, to enforce the law. Uh, my uh, office, which is really led by career people, incredible career assistants. Here you have my branch chief, Bob uh, Bulford, Sammy Nucci. My office does hundreds of these cases. But they will tell you, and I will tell you, that we cannot arrest our way out of this problem. The solution cannot just be to arrest drug dealers, although that's part of the solution. The solution cannot just be to have more treatment beds, although that is part of the solution. The solution cannot just be to require doctors to see if a patient is doctor shopping, although that might be part of the solution. And the solution cannot just be to get in front of every parent and teacher and child and tell them that making the mistake of trying heroin might be the last mistake they ever make, although that is part of the solution. We need an all of the above approach, law enforcement, treatment, get control of the stream of pills to come together as a community and educate people to stop experimenting. You know, I will tell you, you sort of take a step back, it's, it's shocking to many of the people, including me, how heroin of all drugs is you know, popular again. Most of us remember heroin was a dead-end drug for hopeless people. It was sort of the last stop on the trail of misery. It still is. But as we have begun our work on this epidemic, I'm struck at how many good people come to me or somebody in the U.S. Attorney's Office with a personal tragic story. From that law enforcement secretary to the cameraman at one of my events who came up to me and told me about his personal story, to a nursing student who graduated from the same suburban school as my kids go to. People from all backgrounds, all races, all socioeconomic classes have a story to tell. These are our kids, they're our neighbors who are dying, and they're dying in record numbers. That's why I say heroin is truly everyone's problem. The action plan that we've come up with the things that you're doing, they're just a model, but they're a good start. Now, words like crisis and epidemic get thrown on a lot these days, but I can tell you I spent 20 years in law enforcement and I can't think of a problem that I've encountered that comes as close to the death and destruction that we're seeing that has been visited on us by heroin. Now, President Kennedy, to paraphrase him, used to say on the hopeful side that this problem is man-made. Like problems that are man-made, good men and women can solve them. I hope that you, the men and women in this room and in this community, will help us to lead that effort. Thank you. to respond to written questions submitted from the audience. Cards for you to write on are at each place, at each table, and if you have a question, please raise your card and they will be collected. Uh, at this time, we will invite David Hunter, the program chairperson for the Akron Roundtable Board of Directors, to present your questions. Let's start off with this question. Mr. Dettelbach, you mentioned in your remarks about how this epidemic knows no geographic or socioeconomic uh, boundaries. Uh, can you offer some insights for our audience on some of the telltale signs of heroin use or usage of other drugs for that matter? Uh, 
Um, so um, I, I admit this is not my area of expertise, but I've listened to enough presentations that I can sort of parrot back some of the things that I've been told. So uh, mood swings, changes in behavior, obviously, is a key one, right? The other kid who's always been getting A's and all of a sudden they come home with D's. It, maybe it's, there's something going on beyond just that they're not trying, you know, at school. Uh, so changes in behavior, mood swings, and of course, uh, you know, changes in uh, physical space uh, privacy. So, you know, a kid who you always used to keep their door open, who all of a sudden the door is closed all the time. Look, it could be that they have a new boyfriend or girlfriend, but it could be something worse. And I just think as parents, we need to uh, sometimes we cut our kids. Uh, too much slack because we don't want to drive them away, right? We want to trust them. Uh, you know, you're protecting your kid sometimes by by getting into their business a little bit. We always get uh, thoughtful questions from our audience today. There's no exception. One member asked this, based on your past experience in human trafficking, is there a connection between this problem and the heroin epidemic? Have you seen any related cases in Ohio? So yes, uh, there is, um, and very recently, uh, we had a sentencing in a case just last week uh, in Akron involving an individual who was uh, a horrible predator engaging in human trafficking. And uh, one of the tools that he was using uh, to enslave his victims was heroin. Uh, heroin that was, quote, free, right? Well, nothing is free. Um, and so we do see connection between those things. And um, thankfully for the safety of our community as a whole, that particular individual will uh, not be uh, rejoining our community. So. I'm gonna mangle the name of this medication, but I'll give it a shot anyway. Please give us your thought on law enforcement using the heroin antidote nalazone? Naloxone. Yeah. Naloxone. What program should be mandated for individuals whose lives have been saved by the administration of this drug during a potentially fatal overdose? Uh, I talked a little bit about naloxone. I'm a big proponent of using naloxone and having law enforcement and having it available to family members as well. Uh, naloxone, first of all, you need to understand, is a very unpleasant experience for, uh, for uh, a, uh, an addict. It, it simulates withdrawal. So uh, people who take naloxone and come out of a, a uh, an overdose situation are in no hurry to take it again. Um, and as I told you, uh, surviving an overdose statistically has been demonstrated over time to be one of the single most significant events in a person choosing to try to get into treatment. So I do hear people that are concerned about naloxone. Well, we're just sort of enabling the person to continue to take uh, heroin. I, I, most of the doctors and treatment professionals that I've seen don't feel that way, and I think they have the better argument on this, is that people are not going to engage in uh, near-death experiences consciously um, on the off chance that they'll get naloxone and be safe. Uh, on the other hand, the presence of naloxone in every squad car, in every belt, and in every uh, EMT's kit you know, has saved hundreds of lives in the very short time that it's been on the street. So to me, it's not a close balancing. And I think in terms of mandating, you know, the problem with mandating, mandating treatment doesn't work. People don't do well in treatment when they don't want to be there. So, but I do think that the program that you have, the ADM uh, board has here, is a really a model program, which is, you know, what I think should be mandated is I think we should go visit those people and try to convince them that you know the alarm went off. Don't hit the snooze button. Wake up, get up, and go go and go to treatment. Several questions play off this theme. They'd like you to comment on possible comparisons between heroin and meth. Is one worse than the other? Um, that sort of thing. Uh, don't do heroin. Don't do meth. <laughs> uh, uh, it's hard to say what one is worse or not worse than the other. These are, uh, heroin is a horribly addictive substance. I mean, I think pharmacologically it's just, it, it, it's, it's quite literally a death grip. But that doesn't mean that, that it's okay to do math. Uh, and, and you need to understand that. A lot of people, and in case you just don't want my advice, a lot of people go to jail for a long time for meth too, uh, for meth distribution. So 
So I, I don't think that there's any uh, way to rank these problems. I can tell you though right now, heroin is, is just by far the most significant problem I've seen, not just now, but really going back 20 years. We have, we have this question from the audience. In response to the heroin addiction epidemic, you mentioned the work of education, law enforcement, treatment, and health care. Are members of the faith community, priests, rabbis, and pastors, being given a seat at the table for a unified, holistic approach to this huge community challenge? Uh, yes, very much so, and a very, very important members of the, I, I sort of put that in the prevention effort. Uh, very important members in most uh, comprehensive crime approaches, members of the faith community, and, and this, is, this is included. And I would encourage any members of the faith community who are out there who want to get involved to, to, to call up law enforcement, call us up because we really, really enjoy uh, working with people who get to talk to people outside of a confrontational situation and persuade a lot more people to listen to their preacher, rabbi, uh, imam than listen to their lawyer. Two part question here. Is there a drop box for pills in Summit County? And at what age do you think we need to start educating our children about heroin and drug addiction? Uh, there, are, there are many drop boxes in Summit County, uh, is the answer. And I'm sure Summit County, like Cuyahoga County, is working on putting even more out there. So, yes. And at what age? Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, Certainly, I say this as a parent, not a lot, certainly earlier than I'd like to admit. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, but, you know, individual parents have to make these decisions. It's not, it, you know, and I don't know how to advise you to say, you know, is it is 13 too early? You know, I don't know. That's the honest answer. We have time for a few more questions. One member asks, what about mandatory reporting of suspected drug use? Who, how, and when? Uh, well, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't even, I'm not quite sure I understand the question to know enough how it, what, what you're talking about. Um, you know, reporting of, of drug use is a good thing, I think, in general. Um, suspected drug use, I'm not quite sure what that means, and so I'm, gonna, I'm a little hesitant to wade into that. And reporting to whom? I mean, look, if you think that a friend or colleague is uh, taking heroin, or quite frankly, if you think that they're drinking too much, or involved in any addictive behavior, you know, I think, I think you know, you should report it, but I'm not sure you should report it to me. I, I think you report it to their wife, their father, their mother, uh, somebody who can help intervene and care for that person. And I think there's a lot of outs that we give ourselves in our community about not wanting to mix into other people's business not wanting to lose the friendship, not wanting somebody to be upset with us. Look, you know, uh, I, I lose a friendship any day of the week uh, if I thought that there was a chance that I was saving this person's life. And uh, I think off, all too often those kind of things we tell ourselves are cop-outs. So uh, I don't know if I'm in favor of mandatory reporting, but I think we're, I'm in favor of people being better neighbors and friends. We have time for two more questions. In light of Colorado legalizing marijuana, how do you feel about the legalization of marijuana in Ohio? Well, this is, this is one of those situations where um, I will tell you that I, 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 most of the time people who work with me will tell you that I, I very, uh, I bridle the people telling me that I have bosses, uh, but I have a lot of bosses. And this is one of those ones where these kind of decisions, uh, they get made by other people. So I'm going to punt on this. I don't think I'm going to get into the business of prognosticating about things. Uh, but I will tell you, just as, as a factual matter in law enforcement, I will tell you that there's a big debate out there about the pros and cons of, of, of legalization. And I get that. I don't want to wade in there. But I will tell you that, that the use of, of marijuana it is a harmful drug, and it's a gateway drug to other drugs. Now, I know that does not end the debate, uh, but I think that all, all too often that, that fact gets skipped over in talking about these things. So I just want people to understand that we see those effects, and those are, those are real things. 
after a string of sobering questions, we often like to end roundtable on a lighter note here. And I know as part of the judicial system, you're familiar with background checking. We've done a little background checking of our own, and I think we have this right that when you graduated from Hawkins School, you were the career leading shot blocker at basketball there at the school. So I the, still am. The, very good. <laughs> <laughs> So the question is this, might you share an anecdote about playing pickup basketball at Harvard Law School with fellow law student Barack Obama? Uh, uh, how about this? Uh, he can go both to his right and his left. <laughs> presentation, just awesome presentation. We thank you so much for coming here today and um, being, uh, bringing us some timely information. Um, forward, please. On behalf of the Akron Roundtable, I'd like to present to you the Contemplative Sun as a memento of your visit to Akron today, to Akron Roundtable. This celebratory work of art was designed by Don Drum, who is a local artist in Crestman. Thank you. So much. <laughs> thank you. audience to join us again at the Quaker Station in downtown Akron on Thursday, July 16, 2014, when the Akron Roundtable will present Diane Laney Fitzpatrick, an author, who will present on the topic, The Journey of a Thousand Miles is for Amateurs. Also, we invite you to our Roundtable Extra, which will be on Thursday, August 7, 2014, when we will present Dr. Scott L. Scarborough, the new, the incoming president of the University of Akron. Thank you for being with us today and have a wonderful week. <laughs>